Hello, Pastor Ronnie Wolf, pastor of First Baptist Church in Harrison, Ohio. And uh, I want to bring you another message today about uh, this message will be about the blood of redemption, the blood of redemption. I want to give you three points if you want to jot them down. Some of you good preachers will be able to make a really good message out of this, no doubt. I'm going to talk about the blood supplied the blood applied, and the blood denied. First of all, we talk about the blood supplied. We meet a good verse over in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. Many of you are familiar uh, with that verse. And uh, in 9.22, the book of Hebrews, it says, And almost all things are by the law purged by blood. And if you will read the Old Testament, especially in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, you'll find that there's a lot of blood there. In fact, the word blood is used 122 times in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Hebrews 9.22 goes on to say, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. And so we, we see the law uh, used a lot of blood. And then it goes on to say and applies it to uh, everyone. It says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Uh, so we find the idea of blood um, implied in the making of clothes in Adam and Eve, even there in the Garden of Eden, uh, to give us the idea that um, Adam and Eve were redeemed by blood. See, they had uh, they were not redeemed by what they did or did not do. They were redeemed by blood. Uh, the blood of the animal there was shed, and that's the implication. It doesn't say in the book of Genesis that the, uh, an animal was slain and the blood was used, uh, but it implies it because how else could God have gotten the skins of animals to make them clothes if the blood hadn't been shed. Uh, and so uh, Adam and Eve represent Christ's blood, that is the, the blood of the lamb that was slain or the blood of the animal that was slain represents Christ's blood. And that blood of Christ would redeem his people from their sins. Uh, Genesis also deals with blood as it's shed from a man when it says in Genesis 9, 6 that we're not to take uh, blood from a man or and of course that would imply murder and the Bible says if anybody does that that his own blood should be shed. Uh, Genesis also deals uh, with a law against eating blood. Genesis 9, 4 says but flesh or the flesh with the life thereof which is the blood thereof shall ye not eat. And even in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, that's one of the restrictions uh, that uh, uh, the apostles gave uh, to the church at Antioch. That they, One of the restrictions was that they are not to eat blood. In Exodus then, uh, the second book of the Old Testament, we find that water was turned into blood, which symbolizes death there in Egypt. And so blood represents life and blood represents death. And when we go to Exodus chapter 12, we find uh, the blood that was supplied for the Passover. Uh, and it was supplied by the Passover lamb that was killed to supply the blood to put on the doorpost before the enemy, that is death, uh, was to pass over every door in Egypt. And it would exempt every door that had this blood upon the door. This blood uh, was supplied by the animals that they slew uh, the lamb that was slain, that was killed for, um, for them to put the blood on the door so that the enemy, death, the angel, we call, uh, we say the death angel came by and when he saw the blood, he passed over and did not bring death to that, to that house. And so it was supplied by the animals that were killed for the ceremonies that were later given by God to Israel through Moses. They continued to, to kill these animals to picture and to actually shed the blood of the animal. But it was a picture, a shadow 
of the coming of the true blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, that would cleanse us from our sins. And uh, so then there must be blood shed or supplied for uh, that which is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the giving of himself as the Lamb of God that was slain uh, before the sin, before the world began. Um, and, and the Bible, uh, the giving of himself was the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And uh, Romans 5 verse 9 says much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now that verse says a lot. It says uh, much more. Uh, we're being saved, being now justified by his blood, we are saved from wrath through him. Uh, in, in Egypt, the children of Israel were saved from the wrath of God upon Egypt when they applied the blood to the door. And we, through the blood of the Lamb, the real Lamb, Jesus Christ, and his shed blood on the cross, we are saved from wrath, that is the wrath of God that will come upon those who don't believe and trust in him as personal Savior. And we, through faith, have fled that wrath and have been saved from that wrath. Um, and so the supply of blood that cleansed our sins was uh, came from Christ. Uh, and he supplied the blood and he took away our sins. Notice, notice Luke 22 and verse number 20. It says, Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is said for you. And so today we actually look back to the blood of Jesus Christ where Israel looked forward to it, we look back to that blood that has already been shed uh, on the cross and has already been applied by, uh, to, to bring redemption, you see. And so it's the blood uh, that, uh, that was shed for us, for the redeemed, for those who would believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it says uh, that uh, this cup in the Lord's Supper uh, is the cup, it says it's the New Testament, the New Covenant, in my blood, which is shed for you. So when we drink of the cup of the New Testament in the Lord's Supper, we are picturing uh, the uh, blood of Jesus Christ and how it was shed for our sins. And when we take of the Lord's Supper, that's what we should have in our mind. Uh, otherwise, we may take it unworthily or in a, in a fashion that would not uh, remember the true blood that saved us from our sins, just like in the bread, we symbolize his body uh, and how it was crushed and how he suffered in his body for our sins. The second point of the message is the blood applied. With well, the blood from the lamb for the children of Israel in their first Passover had to be not only drawn from the animal but it had to be applied to the doorpost. Even so, the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross for our sins, it must be applied, not to a doorpost, but to the heart of every believer before it can accomplish its purpose. So not only did Christ supply the blood uh, that could wash away our sins, but he applies this blood to the heart of his people. And through faith, he brings propitiation or satisfaction to God's wrath. He brings righteousness and he, he brings remission of sins. Uh, Romans 3 in verse number 25. Be nice if you had your Bible could turn there because I want to show you three words in that verse, Romans 3.25 that I just mentioned. And then, and I'll read it to you and you'll notice them and you might want to underline them in your Bible. Romans 3.25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Well, if you'll underline the word propitiation, underline the word righteousness, underline the word remission, those are the three things that I had mentioned before I read this verse. You might also do a little study on that word forbearance, but I didn't bring it up 
for discussion at this in this message. First of all, the blood is applied by propitiation. That is, Jesus satisfying God's demand for perfect righteousness in his uh, perfectly righteous life and also satisfying God's demand for justice uh, against our sins, which was paid to the sufferings of uh, Jesus Christ. That satisfied God and appeased God as payment for our sins. God is satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection and his eternal intercession. And so then he makes peace and reconciliation before God. That's what propitiation means. Satisfied. God is satisfied in everything that Jesus did. And he is satisfied in everything that Jesus accomplished. And every, everything that Jesus' blood has accomplished in the believer. That he has peace with God. He is reconciled to God. He is justified before God. And there are other words we could also uh, uh, put to apply to that. Not only that, but the blood was applied by righteousness. <clears throat> you see, the most perfect lamb that could possibly be had in Israel was to be offered to God to the shedding of blood uh, for, uh, for their purpose. And that was to show forth the blood of Jesus Christ. And so a perfect lamb had to be offered to God through the shedding of blood for true and real forgiveness of sins to be accomplished. And this Jesus did in his perfect sinless body. If you'll search in the New Testament, uh, you'll find several scriptures that apply to the perfection of Jesus Christ. He had no sin, he did no sin, and he knew no sin, the Bible tells us. It might take a minute or two to look those verses up. I really should have given them to you here, but I was afraid it would take too much time to do that. Uh, and then uh, the blood was applied by remission. A remission is a payment. And Christ's payment for our sins was rich and full, agreeing with God's demand. The price was paid in full. Uh, let's notice Colossians 2 and verse 13 where it says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. The word forgiven there um, is the same word as the word remission. And so we're forgiven of all our trespasses. When we're saved by the grace of God, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and his work in his death, burial, and resurrection and his perfect life and his intercession, then we can be forgiven of all of our sins, all of our trespasses. That's a complete salvation. God doesn't do anything incompletely. He does everything completely and fully. And when he saved our soul, he saved it completely. He saved it forever. He didn't save it uh, for a day or two or a month or two. He didn't save it partially so we have to fulfill some good works to complete our salvation. No, he forgave us of all <clears throat> our trespasses. As a payment, remission is also a deliverance from bondage. Uh, when we were lost, we were under the bondage of sin. Galatians 4.3 says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. That means the world and the devil's kingdom had captured us and blinded us from the truth of God's word. It had also bound us in our sins and in, our, in, and in the, the world's influence. But notice what it says in Galatians 4.4. 4. It says, but when the fullness of time was come, <clears throat> God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now that's freedom. You see, under the, under the influence of the world, we were captured by the world and uh, we were in bondage to our sins. But the Lord freed us from that and adopted us into his family as his sons and made us free from the bondage of sin. So Jesus applied the blood when he went to the cross to die, to carry our sins away as far as the east is from the west. Psalm 103 and verse 12 
says, For as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Man, isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus Christ has taken our sins and he has cast them as far as the east is from the west. Now, I've done a lot of meditation and a lot of thought on that, and I cannot come up with any logic that can explain what it means by as far as the east is from the west. And so that's the way it is with our sins. No matter how much I try to think about it and try to logically come to a conclusion concerning it, I cannot imagine how that our sins can be cast as far as east is from the west. But I do believe that it's so. And that's what we have to believe in being saved. Not only that, the Bible says our sins are sewn up in a bag. Job 14 verse 17 says, My transgression is sealed up in a bag, and thou sewest up my iniquity. Now that's an interesting thing. They're sewn up in a bag and sealed in there so they'll never come out again. But then the Bible tells us in another verse that our sins have been cast in the depths of the sea. Micah chapter 7 and verse 19 says, He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. <laughs> and so I wrote a song named, How Wide is the Ocean? How Deep is the Sea? That's how far he has cast our sins from us. That's a wonderful thought, isn't it? And so as far as the east is from the west, sealed up in a bag, and cast into the depths of the sea. You don't ever have to worry about your sins again because when the blood is applied by grace through faith, the applying of the blood of Christ to our sins by the grace of God through faith in Him, we don't ever have to worry about our sins. But then the third part, the third point of the message is the blood denied. Now we know that Peter denied the Lord. But he denied the Lord in his person, and in his fellowship, and in his contention against the Lord's being taken and judged and put to death. He did not deny his blood. But when a person refuses to believe in Christ as Savior and his precious shed blood for the remission of sins, then he's denying the very blood that can and will save that person from sins through faith in his name. Titus talks about this in Titus chapter 1 and verse 16, where it says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and to every good work reprobate. They deny the Lord's blood by professing that they know Him, but they don't really know Him. They know Him in a certain way. They know about Him but they've never really submitted themselves to him and to his righteousness. They're like those in Romans 10.3, where it says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves into the righteousness of God. A lot of people profess to know God, but they know, they know only of him. They don't really know him. They deny the Lord's blood by their works. Because, you see, their works are worldly and temporal, fleshly. They're weak and ineffective. They claim to be going to heaven by their works. But there can't be any boasting to God about so-called good works. The Pharisees did their works to be seen of men. Matthew 23, 5 says, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. But a true believer does his works because God works in him to produce good works. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. The lost people, their works are abominable, and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate, as we read in Titus 1 and verse 16. Now, in conclusion, we want to say that the blood that's been shed from the body of Jesus Christ was, uh, excuse me, was supplied by Christ himself. It was applied by Christ himself 
when he died on the cross. And this blood is denied by wicked works and by unbelief. The person who den denies it by his wicked works and turns away from this blood from Christ and his work for salvation, this person will be denied by God himself. One day we'll all stand before God in judgment. And my question is, will you be a believer and enter into the joys of God's kingdom? Or will you be a denier and hear the voice of the Lord as recorded in Mark 7, 3, when it, where it says, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye, uh, ye that work iniquity. Once Christ's blood has been shed for the remission of sins, once it had been uh, shed out from his body, he lay down in a borrowed tomb. But then on the third day afterwards, he resurrected, showing that he had power in resurrection. In John eleven twenty five, 25, he says he is the resurrection and the life. The ver uh, verse goes on to say, He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Do you want to live eternally? Don't deny the blood of Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The old song says there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. I pray that you have trusted him. If you have not, will you today repent and turn from your sins and your wicked works? And will you turn to Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his perfect life, and his intercession for the saints as he sits at the right hand of the Father? I would love to know uh, today that you have been saved by the grace of God. Until next time, thank you and God bless you.